Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Bashir Fancy. You know me as the founder and CEO of BizTech, which is Business and Technology Professionals Association of Canada. And from time to time, and we have this conversation, but we call uh, Fancy that conversation that changed our world. And so we have a very interesting topic today and a very interesting person um, with us that you now see on the screen. Um, Professor Sangwan uh, from Seneca actually is, 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 is a background is pretty impressive and more. I will let him tell you and let him tell you, then I can pick it up and then we we'll go to a conversation that we're going to have. And what topic we're going to talk about is kind of the civic responsibility, make it a general. Uh, the conversation is going to be about what is our role, what is going on, and we're seeing it happening right now. But Never mind about the topic. We'll introduce this properly. Welcome and good morning, uh, Professor Sangwan. Why don't you tell our listeners uh, about your background? Uh, Please. Thanks, Bashir. Uh, it was really nice to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm Heman Sangwan. I'm a full-time professor at Seneca College School of Marketing. Uh, but I also uh, teach at Shulik mm. School, uh, mostly courses in data science and analytics. And I have a strong passion for you know, bringing data-oriented decision-making and public policies. And as you know, Bashir, this is how where we started our discussion. Yes. And this is where I am. Uh, in addition to my teaching mm -hmm. career, I spent uh, about 12 years in industry, mostly in uh, management consulting, marketing research, and economic mm -hmm. consulting. Uh, so here I am. It's fantastic. Welcome. And to the people, you will see it at the start of our presentation, the full detail and background of Professor Sangwan, so you'll know why he's amply qualified to talk about this subject. So today's subject, as I men mentioned, about civic responsibility, what is happening, how we choose the leaders, what happens. So we'll start in this conversation by talking about the fact that, you know, coronavirus has exposed a lot of things, right? If one looks at it, but one that stands out quite a bit, and if you take all the politics and party lines, and which is we're not interested in that, what stands out is our decision making skills, our ability to make decisions and understand that. And so, why don't we start by examining the coronavirus pandemic and how it's been handled, not handled, whatever, and what do you think then are the issues? Why don't we start with that? Yeah, thanks, Basir. This is a this is a very good question. Uh, it's an important question, but at the same time, it's a difficult question. Yes. Uh, now, my uh, role here is you know uh, not to go in this path of criticizing because that path is never ending. Yes. But I want to bring it a perspective that um, from decision making where we lacked and what we can do. Uh, both at a you know, micro level and at a macro level. So there is no doubt uh, that the events like coronavirus uh, is very unique uh, with the global uh, nature with profound impact on health, economy, jobs, and you name it. So it is likely, uh, it's fair to say that uh, because we never predicted the scope of this, uh, its impact, uh, we cannot prepare or we, we were not prepared. So there was definitely, you know, uh, lack in terms of planning and, and in terms of, you know, uh, efficiency in decision making, and we get that. However, uh, now it's been almost a year or more than a year, and we still see examples of uh, where you think that this could have been improved. At the same time, event like this also exposed our you know, limitations in many other aspects, which should have been fixed even before this event came. So I'll give you a simple example. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in this world of technology. Uh, there have been lots of focus on e-governance, where government is interacting with businesses, um, across within their own departments and with residents uh, on e-platforms. 
and you can talk to people uh, how easy it is to apply for EI or any government services over phone or online. I think there is a serious infrastructure, IT infrastructure or infrastructure problem. Now, in normal times that we got away with that, but here comes coronavirus and people lost job. They started applying for these different services and programs, whether it's a businesses, small businesses or individuals. And it exposed the, the, you know, the poor quality of that, that system. So ideally that should have been fixed long before events like this. Right. But this event aggravated or, you know, uh, the, the, the outcome or the, the exposure to, you know, uh, lack of those infrastructure. And that thing is still going on. Like I know, I personally know people where they want to apply for EI and it the waiting time is three hours. Once they submit a request, six weeks, they don't receive any uh, you know, communications from the government, nothing is happening. So it becomes on residents part or small businesses part to, to, to put their effort to get the updates. And that's, that has nothing to do with, you know, uh, like how our, our health structure was or health infrastructure was. This is a purely basic service which residents can expect from the government in today's time. I mean, look at uh, the amount of taxes we pay. So in Canada, you know, um, if you make $100, you're close to $45 is going in taxes. And at that level of, of public expenditure, having such a poor quality, especially in basic services around finances, around government services, around taxes, we don't hear. It takes enormous effort just to get through those uh, systems. So that was one. Now let's talk about coronavirus itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say uh, if we break it down, this uh, public policy around it. So one was the planning and the second was execution. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to tell you that uh, we suffered on both sides. So think about, uh, let's talk about planning. Uh, there is no doubt when the event first came, uh, it was kind of a surprise to, to our political leaders and decision maker. And we we give them, you know, uh, we give them uh, some benefit of doubt that yes, you were also struggling and, and you were trying to figure out what to do. But now see the outcome. So let's f don't worry about what the planning was because we don't know what happens behind the door in parliament or at Queen's Park or at even local municipality level. But let's see the outcome. It's a small country, relatively speaking, population wise. Mm -hmm. We are not even 50% at vaccination. And, and you know, you think about other type of plannings where suddenly there is a new guidelines coming in that, um, this is what we're going to do. Let's shut it down. These type of you know uh, businesses and let's open up these. It appears as if there was no rule or logic around it. It was mostly governed by either under pressure from opposition, whether it's at a federal level or provincial level, or it's showing a complete lack of you know ability to, to make decisions. So you just made, and later on, you were just justifying those decisions. So that was about the planning. Execution wise, one of the biggest uh, limitations which coronavirus event has exposed is our deficiency or you know lack of proper infrastructure around supply chain. So you talk about food, you talk about essential commodities, or you talk about vaccinations. Mm -hmm. We need serious people who understand the complexity of supply chain management. Right. Absolutely. And, and we need to give those people decision-making power, that this is how you manage vaccine distribution. This is how you manage essential commodity distribution so that people don't, you know, uh, go into this mentality of hoarding toilet papers and, and all these, you know, essential supplies. So that was the, 
you know limitation exposed at the at the execution part and and mm-hmm. we are still seeing the outcome <laughs> i mean we 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 still not done yet no no so the the bottom line is the point i'm trying to make is when you know for sure that you don't have such skills and we agree you know depending on what your background and skills are you may not have the ability to understand complexity of let's say supply chain or complexity of health matters but as a politician you are the decision maker so why don't you take help from experts why don't you take help from people who have done these kind of jobs over and over and bring them on board you know you know there's two three very powerful points you made and we can probably drill down as you mentioned the the lack of planning and you know rule 101 in risk management is you plan for things not to work and to go wrong and yes you, know, you have a backup of a backup absolutely and it's kind of something i was thought right at the start of my career because i was there and there was no planning there yet yet if you look around all the leaders were talking about the potential of a pandemic coming down so it's not that they hit them completely with a surprise because us was talking about it other countries were talking about saying this is going to happen so that one part where you talk about lack of planning but we still keep cut them slack and saying okay you were not aware fair enough and then it came the time of at least execution or once you knew what was happening you should have some semblance of organization in place because the truth is is like any business plan yeah you put a plan together you keep examining and saying oops now those factors under which i made that plan has changed i better change my strategy it appears to me and from what you were saying also i think we are both on the same page is they did not adjust to that right so they uh, the execution was very poor an example right so what you just talked about and i would like you to 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 drill down on that is they said okay we're going to you know give every vaccine in every postal code or every place exactly equally so nobody can accuse but the problem was that when they had hot spots you had amazon where thousands of people are working and you know problem number one so their breakouts that can the post had all sorts of uh, you know virus breakout breakout. events yes yeah. big, big events and they didn't shut them down and there were two reasons from what at least why i understand which was one that the poor people can't afford to stay away because it means lack of pay and they have to support families so they kept going now there is no way the company did not know this right they knew this thing but they did not want to pay because they don't care i'm getting low wage guy coming uh, the production is their part the guy is falling apart so likes of amazon or whoever else but this is where the government should have understood that if we have somebody in the hospital is costing them 35 3600 dollars a day i see use a food could they not have paid that guys the one day or at least forced the company to do that and saying pay them that part and and so let, let's pick that up because that is where i think you had talked about because your background is also there is what type of data was used to make this decision uh, <clears throat> another good question bashir and another difficult question okay now uh, here is let's first talk about canada as a country as a economy right it is at least to politician it's no brainer that 50% of our country is living paycheck to paycheck and this is before pandemic right right so now you have a country where majority of people cannot afford a sudden expenditure of let's say 200 dollars right. per month they don't have any emergency fund and let's forget about the retirement planning that's another <laughs> <laughs> it will take a long time to discuss that right now if you don't have these data or 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 figure in your mind when you are making these decisions when when a crisis is hitting i think it shows your ability it shows that 
you don't have even the basic knowledge of how things work in this country. Now, once you have these uh, close to 50% people living paycheck to paycheck or at a risk of defaulting their basic loans in normal times, what do you think is gonna happen when, when country is losing jobs? So at a federal level, at a provincial level, or in fact, at a municipal level, wherever it's possible, why don't we have certain procedures in place which are not contingent on whether you are a liberal or a green or a conservative? In other words, how about you know uh, giving these customers or, or residents some comfort? So as you mentioned, if you are sick, of course you can't go, but if you go, you are spreading that virus. Let's talk about other type of <clears throat> uh, challenges uh, average customer is facing. You signed up for something, uh, let's say a, a mini trip or, or, or product, and because of coronavirus, you could not use it, so you had to cancel it. The burden is on you as a customer or as a resident. And you can talk to many people who are still haven't recovered their money from airlines. So whether it's uh, Canadian airlines or whether it's you know uh, foreign airlines, but they have base in Canada, why don't we have at a federal or provincial level these regulations that the moment you can't deliver service, by default you have to pay within a certain time frame. And I personally know many such people where it becomes that daily two hour routine just to talk to people with credit card on customer service, airlines, and, and it drains their energy. So as a politician, why can't you make these laws? And let's say you making these uh, laws for long term is not a viable option. I mean, make it during crisis period that, hey, whenever somebody wants to cancel, any service from you, by default, you have to pay. And, and I understand, you know, many industries are, are struggling, especially the airlines, but there's a, that's a business risk, right? So as a customer, if I don't get the service, shouldn't I get the refund back in an in acceptable form? Let's examine this, Let's examine it because um, I had a senior role in the, airline, the very airline that you just talked about. And I think you hit the nail on the head because incompetency or part of the airline, and it is in, because there's a such thing called trust funds that if I book a flight, you have not booked and cannot book it as revenues till the service is provided. So that's really trust funds, because if you don't travel or I don't give you the service, I have to give you the money back. If you don't travel because you chose to, there are some penalties and stuff like that. And there are reasonable things already in place. But if I can't provide the service, I have to give you the money back. But or, the, or, or some legitimate arrangements, some <laughs> acceptable arrangement. Right. Which they didn't do, by the way. Which they didn't do. And... Why should the government, right, have to give them billions of dollars so that they in turn can give you a refund? Because at the end of the day, this money from the government is, is taxpayer money. Yes, it's so coming out words, of our pocket. So they're taking money out of your pocket to give it back to you. And it's not making any sense to me, right? And, and let's flip the situation. If you miss your cell phone bill payment once a month, I'm pretty sure within 10 days, you'll get a warning letter. Yep. Second time you miss it, it's gonna hit your credit rating. Yes. Why these rules are asymmetric? Why can't, if any companies, and especially the large corporations, when they can't provide service, whether it's pandemic or other reasons, why it is such a long process for customer to get that money back and why it's not affecting their credit or risk profile? Correct. Well, that's a very good question. You know, companies got money from the government to pay back or to help them keep people employed. And uh, there's been a lot of fraud there, too. And, you know, people are making phony claims. But 
but they took the money and they started buying their shares back as opposed to doing the part for, for which it was being, which tells you, which is what you're talking about, is lack of planning, lack of execution, but I'm going to add two more pieces, lack of good oversight, governance and oversight, right? Yes. Like this was the time where you make these decisions knowing that you know everything about your country. Now let's let's talk about a, another topic or another area. Yeah. We know the condition of uh, child care in this country. Mm -hmm. This is not affordable no. for many families. Absolutely. And, and even in normal times, parents were making choices that should we sacrifice work hours to focus on child care and, you know, and there's no doubt, you know, uh, women were more affected relative to men. Right. Uh, that's another, you know, uh, issue another, like yeah. we need to focus on. Yeah. But if you are shutting down the country, where 50% people are living paycheck to paycheck, if you're shutting down the schools where parents don't have access to basic child care, how much burden a typical family has? Imagine. And now on the top of that, they are working from home because their colleagues lost jobs mm -hmm. and they are under this threat, implicit threat that if they don't perform, they might lose their job too. Correct. So for a parent, especially for frontline parents, workers, this is an example of perfect storm. So you're working, you're taking care of child or children, yeah. and you're dealing with these customer service agents because you did not get the service, you're trying to get your money back. And I did not see a single statement from any politicians about constructive steps they are taking. So yes, we they are you know criticizing each other, and this could have been done better. I understand. <clears throat> when average family is going through these three, four big challenges at the same time, what is your short-term policies around childcare? What is your short-term policies around all these you know uh, refunding to customers when they don't get the service? Plus. Can they, you know, uh, go to work when they are still have symptoms or, you know, how can you prevent that? So sh we didn't even see in the short term. Now oh. let's talk about long term. This is an opportunity because you probably know Bashir better than me as a risk person, as a risk management person. Every risky um, situation or every situation where there is uh, you're exposed to your limitation is also an opportunity where you can learn. Right. So we have seen the limitations around childcare, around industries taking advantage of, let's say, average customers. We have seen the limitation in our supply chain. What is our long-term plan? Do we have a plan that there is going to be a uh, secure funding for, for installing or setting up manufacturing plant uh, around vaccination in this country, where you can produce vaccines and these other medications. Do we, are we gonna make significant changes to our childcare infrastructure? So yes, in the recent budget, there was talk around, you know, we're gonna pay 30 billion, but I'm not talking about just the fund. Is there gonna be creative solutions to these problems? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have these plans where, you know, 50% people live paycheck to paycheck? Can we do some things so that that ratio comes down to 30%? What kind, as a policymaker, we do? Now, if you ask a politician, if they say, I don't know or I don't have ability, well, you should not be on those seats then, whether you work at a provincial or federal level, because... In Hmm. Yeah, you're getting six figure salary. Just to think about these decisions, you're not get paid or you should not be getting paid to to create these Twitter, you know, one line uh, sound bites. And this is where, you know, I think we I mean, there's still time. It's a wake up call because, again, you know better than me, Bashir, these type of crisis, there is a very high likely chance they'll come back in some form in the future. 
very little doubt about that. Very little doubt about the last statement is going to come back. And that two, three thing, very important thing that you said, so we can quickly go. One of the problems that, like you said, what we're discussing is not about any particular party, parties, whether it be councillor level, provincial level, or federal level. But we have, as people, have converted everything around party lines. We attack the other guy if there's a comment, and I always come from a background that says, listen to the message, not the messenger. If there's a message, because if you look at opposition parties, if you were to look at the UK, anytime a government in power makes a suggestion, the opposition party for the longest time would turn and say, no, well, we agree with the concept, we think you need to do this thing to make it better, and they all listen to each other. Here, all you are hearing now, if you are, people forget about your party hats, for God's sake, and you will see the opposition ripping apart the government, and it is all about criticizing, criticizing, criticizing. The other guy will blame them. This guy will blame this. But who the heck is talking about the problem? And where are we going to go with this, right? That's number one. Number two, the, the child care thing, which you talked about, very, very important. It's not just uh, because we've had for many years, too long. In fact, they keep talking about child care, nothing ever gets done. And I have to wait and see what they really do as opposed to uh, the budget being there. Because the, then the provinces get involved and say, it's our area, you can't do this. So that all need, they need to get together and say, you know what, it's not about me, the politician, it's about the people whom I represent. Because if you were operating like that in a corporate world, you would get kicked out. As Absolutely. You, right? And I, go ahead, go ahead. Totally agree. And, and I, I want to add one more point. You, you, you mentioned very, uh, this is a very you know, pressing issue. What I want to say is the way a political system works, it's, you know, it's a show business. Yeah. It's glamorized. <laughs> My thinking is, as a politician, you should be sitting in your room reading about these different, you know, policy framework and understanding which one should work, which one should not work, or what worked in the past, what cannot. That's a lot of work. This is why you're getting paid. You're not getting paid to just come up on TV for five minutes and creating sound bites. So when you say, you know, let's see what's going to happen in this recent budget based off, you know, what they allocated. They just, I, I hope they did serious thinking around it rather than just here's 30 billion and we'll do these you know, changes in the childcare policies. Well, I agree with you. It's, uh, it can be a you know, glamorous job as a, as a policymaker or politician, which I don't personally don't think it should be, but it's a more serious job. It requires you to, to reflect, to think, to, to you know, talk to people who are outside of your uh, you know, zone of expertise, just to you know, collect different types of views and see what works. Right. That approach we haven't seen. We haven't seen. And part of the problem may be that we're not attracting the best and the brightest into the government, right? If you really look at it, I, I talked to a few people who got to work for the government. There was a guy who used to work for me. And he told me, you know, this is a lot of hard work and whatever. And he was a pretty bright guy. He left from there to work for the government, plays two days of golf, right? Takes his cell phones of you somewhere more rich. Because, but his incentive to do things is just not there, right? He changed completely because he had security for life. Since there is no such thing in the, in the, in the corporate world, right? Why the heck is it there when we are paying for it in the other side? If you don't perform, you should be out. Or and, if it's there, there has to be a, a equivalent, uh, you know, amount of effort needed. Correct. And 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 I'm talking about you know at all levels. So if, if uh, yeah. I'm okay personally that yes, you have a job security or, or you have pension security, but what are you providing in return? Yeah, yeah. I'm not interested in your show. The I'm value. interested in yeah. give me some serious policy proposals or introduce them, at least talk about them. Some will be rejected, some will be passed. But 
think along those lines. Correct. And I think that is very important. So there are a couple of questions because, unfortunately, due to the technical thing, we lost some time. But anyway, here's the thing. A couple of points I want to cover in the next 10 minutes um, is what lessons have we learned through the coronavirus? This is a big topic, and we probably will visit it again yeah. to drill down more. But if you look at the coronavirus uh, and what has happened in the house, what are the biggest lessons we have learned? So to me, the biggest lesson, or maybe you can think of my suggestion, is yeah. invest in our healthcare supply chain. Okay, yes. If we are too much dependent on other countries, yeah. then, then you know, um, it's going to have its own challenges. You, other countries uh, won't send you vaccine on a priority basis. Correct. You know, that's, that's common sense. Yeah. So invest from a long-term perspective in some of these specific healthcare areas vaccine development, R&D around pharmaceuticals and, and related. Invest from a long-term perspective of how the childcare should be in this country. Do parents will still make those decisions that one of them work, one of them just take care of kids? If that's the case, see the impact on you know economy because uh, Think of childcare as as a long term investment, not as a short term, you know, <coughs> policy. Other thing, there have been lots of talk that even on our food supply chain or basic <laughs> essentials, uh, we are too much dependent on external factors. Whereas internally, uh, because of lack of you know proper incentives or infrastructure. Uh, there are, you know, people or the, the people hesitate to go into, let's say, in agriculture or, or in related field or uh, where they are not involved in these decisions. So that's that's yeah. number three. And yeah. finally, I would say, uh, number four, take a lesson from some of the countries which have managed it so well. So I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, that just shows the one part of it. But in countries like India, yeah. the lockdown happened. In some states, there was a system where if you are not working because of lockdown and you are in the lower income bracket, the authorities arranged to deliver food to their houses. Now, this is, if you think from a supply chain, it's a very sophisticated problem. Because how do you detect which household to go and, and which household uh, all the members are or most of the members are COVID positive and they can't go out? They relied on technology, GPS-based technologies, and they relied on some of these smart you know, people in, 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 in that line of business. So at least for that part, I have to say some of the developing countries have done much better than developed countries. Hey, you know what? Uh, you, you're absolutely right. Again, in the same uh, way, same thought, um, politically and otherwise, we do not necessarily agree or agree with China's policy, but they did bring it under control on their side because they cracked down. Now, that's not the way we operate. But, but, but then you look at some of the Scandinavian countries and Taiwan is a damn good example of how New Zealand and Australia are bloody good examples that they've opened up travel between each other. Yeah. So you're, you're right that you can do that. Now, New Zealand doesn't have draconian policies, perhaps that uh, China to deploy it in terms of cracking down. But you're right. I think that is part of the, the problem. You know, I, I use a term observations. I don't use the word lesson learned because this word has been abused by so many people for so long and corporate world has certainly done that and when i was heading internal audit walked into the room and i said what the heck is this lesson learned nonsense it's happened few times before and you learned nothing lessons learned only happen when you take an observation and you change the behavior 
that got you into that mess in the first, first place. place. Yes. And they, these guys are not doing this. You are seeing it every few years. Now, you uh, said something very important also about the long-term planning around not child care, supply chain, and all those things. Very important. The truth is Canada was world leader with Connaught Laboratories. But many years ago, short-sightedness, quick money, just like as we've done with Highway 407, they sold it. They mm. sold it. Of course, Pfizer is now ripping the benefits of all that. And like you said, we are dependent on other countries. Now we're running around and saying, okay, we're going to do certain things. When you could have had Canadian-owned companies, now we've got Sanofi coming in and we're putting all the money. What we completely forget, that we put billions of dollars into General Motors and they packed their doors and said, okay, goodbye, I'm going back. And did we get that money back? Probably not. No, and, we did. And I'm actually curious now yeah. that in coming elections, whether it's a federal or provincial, right? how many parties or politicians uh, propose some of these things which we discussed? That's the key. And, and, and we'll see, because my sense is it's probably not going to be to that extent. And... And I also, you know, one more thing which I want to add on is that yeah, as yeah. a resident, uh, we do have responsibilities. I understand given our lives uh, and especially around pandemic, there are so many obligations we have to manage, personal and professional. But a basic political literacy, a basic data literacy is needed for everyone. I mean, I teach business courses, I teach data science courses. Uh, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking as a as an average resident, as a you know, tax paying citizen or resident of this country. We need to have ability at the minimum expected level about how policies work, how politics work, what are database or database decision versus somebody is just saying out of the blue. Can we evaluate these different sound bites at their merit? And we need to invest our time to understand that because otherwise you are in this loop where you're working, you're paying taxes, and you're part of that 50% of us where you're living paycheck to paycheck. Who is managing your taxes? I mean, federal government has a budget close to $300 billion a year. So we gave that money and we trusted that you manage this money so that our life collectively gets better. If you are not getting ROI or return on that, we need to do something. And it's yeah. not just about taking sides that if I don't like conservatives, then mm -hmm. let's go with liberal or don't like liberals, let's go with green. There has to be a collective pressure it, on the it, parliament. Uh, you know, Professor Sangwan, you hit the nail on the head because my last question to wrap up today's session, we definitely have to do number two and three because there's a lot more we need to drill down. Food supply chain is one, but a few other things. Is that what is the role of the citizen in all this? And you started to, in fact, um, you pray and which is good. You started to answer because the truth is that we need to get away from what you just said. This party line, yesterday I put something on LinkedIn and it was not a direct attack back on me because it's not, I'm not the author of the article. But the responses from a couple of people went straight to the fact that, they, well, you know, Kathleen Wynne was equally worse in this thing. When did I talk about that? You're talking about the fact that currently we've got a serious problem. I'm not talking about party lines. The fact that there is very little leadership in Canada and why uh, is that. And you talked about exactly, we need to understand the system well, that what are the levels at the city, provincial, federal, how they are aligned or not aligned. What is our role? And I mean our role in electing the right people, right? So that these guys don't get away with the fact that all they do is get up each day, attack the other guy saying, he's very bad, so elect me. Well, last time I went for an interview in my career, I didn't say, by the way, the four people you interviewed are very bad people, hire me. 
Yes. Right? Absolutely. So, hey, why are you doing that? You hire me because of this is what I can do for you. I understand, and right? As a, as a consultant, I can tell you, uh, if you get a client who never questions you, as a consultant, you love that client. Yes. Because yeah. then you can get away with everything. Yes. You make a lot of money and no questions. In this asked. case, that client is us, and these consultants are our politicians. Correct. So if we don't ask any questions, if we don't propose counter solutions, if we don't get involved, and, and it requires, we need to educate ourselves. Correct. And if we don't know how to educate ourselves on like data literacy, political literacy, reach out to people who can help you. I mean, cool. we spend so much time on, on reading Facebook and, and engaging on those silly fights. Why can't we spend some time to understand who are our elected leaders and what kind of decisions they are making? You, you, you know, it's ironical, and I didn't mean to go there for today, but I backed out of Facebook and WhatsApp and whatever for security reasons. And I'm a half a lot happier because I realized that because you get crap coming through and you realize that you're investing time, which is money, into areas that are zero, not productive, right? And every yeah. Tom Dick and Eric has got something to say, it's fine. But the part that you talked about, which is, and we're going to examine that uh, at the next one, is that sound bites is how we elect politicians, photo opportunities, because they're paid up there and they're handing out, you were to call some, any politician anywhere, and he's handing out checks, then he'll be ready to come. And we need to get away from that saying, never mind, what the heck are you doing to our lives? Right? Uh, and what is your plan, short term, mid term, long term, so that we don't get into this mess again? Because, like you said, this the the pandemic is going to come again. Every doctor that I have heard, whether in the U.S. or CDC, they're saying this is not the last one. We're going to see a lot worse because we allowed it to mutate, and when th things start to mutate, it gets out of hand, and then it becomes very difficult at some point in time. You look at look at the most malign vaccine because of stupidity of media and the governments and, and even AstraZeneca has some responsibility is that they were able to turn around and malign them saying AstraZeneca has got this blood flow. Well, the CDC report says four out of a million people. Do you want to hear something interesting? That is the exact number for Pfizer. Four out of a million also get blood clot, but nobody talked about that. So is it political? Is it now? Here's the second part that AstraZeneca was giving it at the cost of under, I guess they're not giving it under, but they're giving it for a couple of bucks, whereas Pfizer is 10 times that. And they declared 10, 15 billion dollar profit just at December. And you're going to see a hell of a lot more then you're going to hear about the fact that you need third dose and fourth dose and whatever. Maybe it's legitimate. Maybe it's not. I don't know the answer. But I need to be able to trust people when they communicate. If people only repeat what they uh, you know, are hearing without questioning, which is what your entire premise is, that why are we not questioning? Right? If we question, we wouldn't be in this problem. And, and context is not just data. Like somebody can say, you know, there were 10 cases uh, in here in Ontario, and there are 10 in Winnipeg, which is worse, obviously Winnipeg, because it's 10 out of a smaller population, population. Yes. whereas 10 in Ontario with that population is not the same thing. That's why our numbers are worse than the United States, because the number of infections and stuff that we've got in people dying is actually the Americans are celebrating, right? that Canada's got worse problems than us. What they were talking about is per capita, per per capita. Number, right? Per capita. So data is only useful if it's in a context, right? And we need to take it in the context of who's making the statement. What is their track record? I mean, look at, look at our memories. Four or seven built by the taxpayer, given away for nothing to Spain, and they are making a hell of a lot more money that money is going out of the country, but we don't question that. 
And the very people who supported that are now attacking the other guys and saying, oh, no, no, he's very good this and the other. We're not talking about individual. We're not talking yeah, about party either. Right? So we need to assume some responsibility on our part. Correct. To invest our time to understand these. We are I guilty mean, is what I'm so saying. Exactly. The one example I give is that if you go to any store, let's say in normal times, let's say Walmart or, or Costco to buy a shirt, you spent decent amount of time to try it, to, to check color, price, this and that, then you make the decision. How come you are selecting politicians on the basis of soundbite? <laughs> Isn't that the most important decision or one of the most important where it could influence your life, your kid's life, your grandkid's life? And your future. And your future. Yeah, can, can you imagine, you know, my son was today, um, on this climate change thing as an international um, summit. And he was addressing, you know, they can have two audiences because he was trying to address his points to the younger guys, right? To, because it's climate change and all that and the other. They're going to be critical that their role... So at the end of the day, it's up, upon us to turn around and start holding people's feet to the fire. If we go into this... You know, very interesting phrase that uh, in UK that I'd learned as a kid is that, you know, I'm okay, Jack, which is meaning I'm fine. I don't care about what's happening to the other people. Then we are all going to get messed up and we need to. So this is a good place to live it so we can pick up. I have made some notes that we can actually, in round two, we can drill down, right? And we can do a full hour thing to turn talk about what is that, we can do, and we can drill down to here are the concrete suggestions, right? Yeah, looking uh, okay, forward to it. Yeah, no, no, it'll be fantastic. This is actually very good because uh, I think you parked some fabulous stuff that we can talk to. So, A, remove the parties out of there completely. Never mind party line. Don't think like that. Think as a Canadian. Think about the fact that these people are employed by you. doesn't matter which party they represent. And if your bosses will not tolerate you not performing, then you need to deploy the same approach that do not tolerate when there's incompetence on the other side, because you, as a taxpayer, we are paying for that, right? And Absolutely. sooner we realize, and then I hear this comment that why is there? Who's there? There is no there. It's us. If we don't do the part, those guys will not do it. His employer, employees. Same thing here. They are our employees, not the other way around, right? Absolutely. And as I mentioned, you know, there's this uh, quote, maybe it's, it's, it's unfortunate that in democracy, you get what you deserve. So if we are electing them, this is what we're going to get. That's a, <laughs> that's a very good place to leave it, actually, to say exactly. They, they, we have to be wiser and we'll drill down by the way, folks. Don't worry about it because we have parked high level. A lot of the there's a lot of points. We'll try to drill down. We are not here to criticize, but we are here to identify and say, okay, now how do we move forward? So we will bring you the next discussion. We'll hopefully do it next week and pick up and talk about the fact that we talked about these topics. Now here's how I think we need to think about it. And if anybody wants to give us a feedback and comment on it, we're very welcome because we're not here about uh, my way or highway, we are all together in this, and it's going to require all of us to think out. I'm not even going to use the word out of box because that's another word that's been abused, a lateral thinking. And you heard it from Professor Sangman. Thank you very much. I really, truly appreciate for doing this because you parked some very interesting things, and we'll record and make it available to everybody, and we'll go to round two. So if you've got uh, any questions or comments, please fire in. And you can see he's, he's got a pretty solid background and uh, part some very, very interesting issues. So thank you very much, sir, for thank doing you. this. Thank you, Bashir. It was my, nice talking to you. My pleasure. And we will do that uh, very soon.